What is up, everybody? It's Mark and Matt with your, uh, you know, weekly, daily kind of episode of volleyball here. <laughs> Welcome to the Better at Beach podcast and YouTube show. Today is Tuesday, August 29th, and that means that we are doing a members only, an elite members meeting where we go through some video analysis. So they are getting into uh, our chat here, and we're going to start welcoming them in about five to ten minutes. And if you don't know, uh, haven't heard it before, our elite members get to post their videos on our private Facebook group. So we constantly analyze their footage so that we can be coaching them year round. And they also get these live meetings with us. So if you guys want to get your videos analyzed, uh, you want to see what some AVP players and coaches would think about your game, your technique, your passing, your setting, your spiking, et cetera, you go to better at beach.com forward slash coaching. And then it puts you into any one of the courses that you want to take and uh we are at the end of the season here people are going to chicago and wrapping up summer the hurricane is on its way to it left california or never even stopped here <laughs> and now it's on its way to florida and st pete our home for camps so not stoked about that uh, but we're just going to start a little conversation here so Matt Hazel, co-host, head coach of the online stuff. What's going on, man? What's up? Just got <laughs> done with the uh, the mini camp. Finished up the, the mini, mini camp, camp in Florida, in Florida yeah. at PCI. That was our first three day yeah. camp uh, at Postcard Inn. So you had 23, 24 people. Yeah, twenty four. Nice. How'd it go? <laughs> it went really good. They, uh, it was probably the. Uh, I think all of us coaches agreed that it was probably the hottest camp that we've ever coached. But the the players they didn't complain about it at all. They just kept. They even played in between in between the sessions. Oh my like God. you know, they're having a good time and loving it at that point. Whenever it's a hundred, I think one day it got to like a hundred and two, and they're still just out there. They were like, "We got to find a way to get sand socks so that we can keep playing." And so they enjoyed it. They they got a lot of touches, and uh, we as coaches enjoyed it too. Had a few nights out with everyone and nice dan just dancing with everyone and uh yeah it was a good time really good time i love that uh did you hear uh because you had uh, nolan you had jm and yeah. you had chad as the coaches so one of my favorite part about being able to to run and be at the camps is just waiting and listening to the other players other coaches and saying how do they teach this what detail mm -hmm or cues do they use that I can just add to my coaching tool belt? Because totally. for all those coaches out there, you could put something on repeat and you know that it works if somebody gets it. But if you don't have, you know, 50 ways of saying it or demonstrating it or creating a goal that actually makes it happen, then you're doing yourself and your players a disservice. I remember I was being told, and I and I heard the same line from my coach, uh, my my freshman year of college, and it was the same line. You have a one speed approach. You have a one speed approach, and I had no idea what that meant, but I just kept nodding and saying, "Okay, I'll fix it to a multi speed approach." You know, didn't know. And then I had somebody else say it in a completely different way the very next year, and I was like. Man, that's what that lady was trying to say for freaking six uh, months. Click. So my favorite part of working with all the coaches is being able to to find somebody's different cue that they heard or a way of explaining it or, or getting an outcome. So did you get uh, any of those that you picked up from this weekend that you liked? Yeah, it was it was fun. There was a lot of there was a lot of contrast training. Um, like for what whatever skill we were doing. JM did really well with the the plan. And so there was a lot of like for let's say for example for passing all right we're gonna try different platforms we're gonna feel what it feels like and did it work you know usually if they're like interlocked it's usually like it probably didn't work there's a few people that it does work for like i immediately think of jake elliott jake elliott always played with his hands intertwined and yeah and he's obviously one of the most ball controlled people i know so <laughs> but but then you like you just see the contrast and just the the ability to figure out what works and what doesn't and <clears throat> and it's a really cool way to learn like it, you you see okay what happens when you swing your arms really heavy you know what happens when you're super stiff how does the ball respond to that 
And so just seeing that way of coaching was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there was some really good fruit from it too. Um, and so one, I think my favorite day was the defense day. I always talk, I love talking about defense. I feel like I could just talk about defense all day and like yeah. what works, what doesn't just experimenting. I think that was a big thing that was fun. Just the experiment, experimenting side of coaching and playing this past weekend. And on, on the defense day, we were talking about how there's different ways to hold your hands. There's one, there's the, um, uh, what's the exercise ball, the big one. Oh, like the like yoga a, ball, the physio yeah, ball? Yeah, it's like there's there's the yoga ball way where you're kind of wide but still can see your hands out in front of you. There's that way. And then there's the uh, the lunch tray where you're holding your hands <laughs> here, but you're kind of open. And then uh, I forget what he called this one, but this was – it, it's like when you're pulling from the net, but I guess just like hands high. Uh -huh. But just the different cues for talking through defense was really fun to hear. And then uh, passing – were two that I hadn't heard before. Well, the t-shirt on the back, that was one. Could you explain uh, that? Could you unwrap that uh, for totally. anybody who's listening? Yeah, so the big thing we were talking a lot about was we need to find something exterior to focus on rather than interior. And so one thing that they, they do, I think, at LMU is they put a t-shirt on people's shoulders mm -hmm. and it helps them keep the shape. So if the t-shirt falls off, that means that you lost your shape while you're passing. But if the t-shirt stays on, then you kept your shape really well throughout the plat throughout the, the process of the pass. And so uh, it was cool to see how that would work. So we have, we were doing drills. It was super simple drills, but whenever they were doing it, they were just really trying to keep a t-shirt on their back. If it fell off, that was the indicator that they lost their shape. If mm -hmm. it stays on, that's the indicator that they kept their shape and they probably had really good body control. And so, so when you, you take, your uh, body, you but, take a t-shirt, you like fold it in half, right? Yeah. And then you roll it up and you put it on the back of your neck. So it's not like draping over yeah. your shoulders. It's just kind of resting right. on so the you back of your neck. One about this size, put it right here. And then you try to keep it there throughout the process of the pass. And it really does. I, I've tried it before and I'm like, wow, that actually really does help me stay balanced and stay in a good shape, good posture so that I can tell this ball where I want it to go. Uh, so that's that's been a fun one that I've been learning a lot about. Uh, just finding something exterior to focus on to mm -hmm. create the habit of a good posture or a good pass of some sort. So uh, it was it was interesting learning all that. Nice. Yeah, guys, coaches, tool, uh, coaches and players out there, this is the benefit of working with a bunch of different coaches as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wouldn't say that you should do a sprint or a carousel of coaches weekly, biweekly, or even monthly, but spend a season spend a you know a quarter th three months with one coach get all of their tips and if you love it and if you're still like learning and embracing new things yet you don't feel like they're just putting everything on repeat right then continue with that coach until you feel like you've exhausted their <laughs> you uh -huh. know their their knowledge and then i think go with a different coach and later on you could always come back to the first coach because now you're at a different level. We have this this metaphor where uh, uh, as you climb as you climb a staircase. So let's say that you're on the first step. You know you can only see something that might be on the tenth step, right? You can't even see or understand the eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth step because your level of vision or the you know the vision angle that you have won't allow you to see that but as you take these second steps and now you're on the second step oh now you can see the 11th step once you're on the third step then you can see the 12th step so if you just keep pushing and progressing you have to know that there's things that you will hear that you don't understand right now or that it means something different in a couple of years much like reading a, a great book you know, there are some books that you could read 10 times in your life and it'll just speak to you in a different way because of where you are in your life. The same exact thing happens with coaching, with sports. Uh, if you hear something a few years later, even a few months later, all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, let me remind myself of that or let me cover that again. And, and it hits you in, in a big way. So um, the, the more tools you have, the more people you work with, the more experience you get learning. It, it's that's what consistency does. You know, but if you're consistently alone, you are not getting anybody else's shortcuts. So I, I again, encourage if you just want to get better, just go get one private lesson. 
yeah. you know, like one point, we say this at every camp, one tip, one key that changes something, that is worth thousands of points for the rest of your playing career, whatever that career looks like to you, whether it's always just being social um, or if you're playing in tournaments. But one tip is thousands of points. It's not just one tip. So uh, I'm going through that in, in tennis now. I used to take a lot of lessons, and now I'm like hiring people, and I'm getting them to give me all of their feedback and let me know what's up so that I can get it going. Like I don't – just to play with all the sports that I've been through, to see how many people never get coached and how they stay at the exact same level – Month in, month out, year in, year out. It's like, dude, get one lesson, you know. Well, <laughs> and the next year, right I see it another. Not currently, I'm sitting at, uh, at a desk. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> but like, <laughs> then you wait. I, so you you've got tennis going. Mm -hmm. You've got jujitsu. Yeah, and pickleball. A little bit of pickleball, you know, like uh, tennis. Tennis flies in the face of pickleball. Uh -huh. uh, it's it's like a choice there. But now I'm on a team. I have my first tournament yeah. on Saturday uh, for tennis. So first mm -hmm. tournament in. Whew, I'm 38. Last point in time I was played a tournament 13, 25 years. What? First tennis tournament in 25 years. Unreal. Yeah, you the might return. not have been born, Matt, when I played my last tennis tournament. <laughs> the return is here. I love it. That's awesome. So, um, okay, quick announcement before we let uh, our members in because uh, we've got some films. They've already got their video uploaded. The We just yesterday, uh, I haven't even told you guys, Matt, but yesterday booked two more three-day camps. So nice. uh, we are going Phoenix and oh, Scottsdale has been – on our asses for so long uh to come out there and to to run some more stuff i did it a few years ago but we rented uh, at indian school park if you're in the scottsdale area that is going to be october 8th 9th and 10th i believe it's a friday saturday sunday one of our three-day camps eight hours a day friday and saturday and six hours on sunday so if you're in the area or if you've never been to scottsdale and you just want to hang out uh and see what it's all about we got a three-day camp, and we got four courts, which means we'll have room for about 40 athletes uh, and no more. So signups will be coming up on the website soon. Be on the lookout for that. And then Ozark, Missouri, Beach Volleyball Ozark. Wow. Our good friend Mike out there. We are rocking that December 8th, 9th, 10th. I might be getting my dates, but the second weekend of October, let's see, is going to be Scottsdale. Yeah, sorry, that's the 6th, 7th, 8th is Scottsdale, and then December 8th, 9th, 10th is Ozark, and we're filling some up. I got I got off the phone with somebody who bought one of our hats. Uh, I was just getting some shipping information, and he wants us to come to Lincoln, Nebraska, and yeah. do something at Spike's, and uh, they've got 10 courts there and a nice restaurant, so he's like, dude, this is... I know nobody really pays attention, but there's so many volleyball players in Nebraska, That's and they're good. about to break that world record by playing the volleyball match in the Nebraska football stadium. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Um, we're going to get something going there, but that has to be fall and spring because they don't have enough indoor sand space. That's sick. Yeah, I feel like mini camps are a great hit because some people can't really take off for seven days, but then mm -hmm. the ones who can't take off for seven days usually take it in the winter. And so it's, yeah. it's cool to see, like, the mini camps kind of just on a rise right now. Yeah. I feel like it's a good um, hit. And the seven days a full on vacation, oh, yeah. you know, like you get into a good mode there. So yeah. I, if you're thinking about like just doing a three day, don't, don't sleep on the seven days. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a little too much fun, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the three days is like a good uh, tester. Yeah. You know? And you. of course for somebody who's got like family uh, oh, yeah. and somebody who's got a job that they can't get away with the three day is the answer. And we want to keep, making ourselves available for that yeah what was so, cool was i heard a lot of the people who were at the mini camp this past weekend they were like oh i gotta come to a seven day now i got i was using this as a tester like i'd love to see what a seven day camp is like now so they're over there signing up for the camps i'm like oh this nice. is sick this is awesome <laughs> yeah and i mean and we have so much more people 
uh, yeah. at, at the, at the seven day camps, you know, we have anywhere from 40 to 70 people right. at those camps and they're still growing. Um, and they're on sale now. So just head on the better beach.com forward slash camps, but let's go, uh, talk to our members and get some film on it. Get it. Here we go. Let in, let in, uh, Mike and Travis. Let's go. Let's go. On, guys. Let's go on team. Uh, I've got an echo on mine. Are you guys hearing an echo? I think it's on mine. It's on mine. mine? No way. No way. I think it's on Travis. Travis. Is anybody watching on their cell phone and on video? Uh oh. Interesting. Testing one two testing. I'm gonna do echo. Oh, I can't do echo cancellation. But you guys are definitely hearing an echo, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Maybe it's me. I think it's Mike. Think it's Mike. <laughs> Should I drop and come back? Uh, I don't know. Travis, do you hear an echo? Try to mute his mic. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Wait. No. Well. Right, Hopefully it, it yeah. fixes itself. Yeah, I, I think we're good now. Okay. Cool. Uh, no, so, who wants, who to, wants be to be first, first fellas? Uh, go for uh, it. Go it. For it. Shoot, guys. guys uh, this is. I don't want to cross. Why don't I hop out and come right back in? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, right. Can, can both, both of you try that? Yeah, sure. Trouble. I'll leave. Hello? All right. This is fine, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it was Mike's. Yeah, Mike's. Is that you know how it turns blue around the border? Uh huh. Every time we would talk, it would turn blue around Mike's. So I think it was his. Oh, Silly Mike. Okay. And I can't change any of this. I think All there's right. an echo control on um on the mic, right? Uh huh. And there's somewhere that could control that. Any better now? Let's see. I think that we're sounds good. great. Yeah. We're good? Yeah. yeah. I didn't change anything, so. Weird. <laughs> is stupid. Okay. <laughs> and Travis is in. Travis, we're testing. Testing, testing. Sounds good. Everything testing, good. Testing. Yeah, there we are. Beautiful. Okay. Cool. Good job, team. Uh, all right. So who posted theirs first? Mike? I'm ready. All right. Uh, and then Travis, we will get to you shortly. So Mike, could you just post that link one more time and then I'll, I'll share it just bring it to the bottom of the chat. I know it's in there, but this for sure. happens for sure. Riverside that will get a big complaint from us. Okay. Uh, while that's sending, I'll just give you what I put together this time around. Yeah. Uh, I played on Saturday, went well, we took third out of 20. Um, but it didn't feel like we got beat. It felt like we beat ourselves. So that's what I want to take a look at. I put together all of my first ball side outs. I really feel like I can do a better job with uh, either some combination of passing, approach, and arm swing. So maybe uh, you guys see something that I haven't so far. But I feel like what I was your focus? Do better. Focus today, uh, in this case, was what we talked about last time, which was uh, feet and shoulders square to the back and trying to take a more aggressive approach, attacking the ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a random low set. Yeah, it's hard to pay, figure out, like, is it the pass? Is it me? Is it, am I not asking for the right set? Because only on a couple of these do I really feel like I, I went out and I attacked it. So I'm trying to pinpoint what it is I can, I can uh, work on and drill out. Maybe it's several things, but I'm trying to find what's, what's the biggest. Okay. Ooh, that boy was big. He waited for you there. Mm -hmm. He got I me. I want to see this kid's move. Sorry, not putting you on blast, but no, yeah. This is beautiful. Oh, this is what I want to show Logan. Uh, we we're <laughs> I was working with this uh, with DJ and and with Logan, the delay. So I want just everybody who's at home to see this and uh, not to compliment your opponents too much, Mike. Yeah, but no, they're good. The the way that he delayed for this was perfect. So he definitely showed you that he was blocking cross, right? His whole body showed you he's blocking cross. And usually once you definitely show somebody which side you're taking, you don't have to worry about them swinging at that location. So in this case, he moved heavily 
into your cross early. There was no question of whether he was blocking line or cross. So that means that he doesn't have to jump to block the hit. When we run a two, where we definitely show person, the opponent, that we're blocking cross, um, we're not doing that to try to get a cross block. We're doing that knowing that any halfway intelligent player is going to try to shoot over or hit hard line. So we're trying to set up that play defensively. If you want to get a block cross, then you have to run a four. Mm -hmm. I, this is something that I wish anybody would have told me. Like, you're playing a banger, okay, he gets a bunch of uh, cross, cross court kills, and then you just run a two. And it's, well, you're not really trapping him there. You're, you're only stopping the bleeding, but you're definitely giving him the other options. The way to block somebody diagonal is by running a four not by running it too. Uh, so let's look at that. And the way he does that is he delays. You jump. Look at this. You have... Pop, pop. You've contacted the ball, and he has not yet left the ground. This is actually really great timing, and it's something we worked for for about an hour and 50 minutes uh, with a guy, Brett, out here, who's an open-level blocker, and DJ, who is blocking the AVP this weekend. Uh, we we're trying to make it happen with Logan during the tournament, and it happened sometimes, and it didn't happen the others. But he showed cross. Defender's definitely in your line, so he makes you try to shoot over him. After you contact, he leaves the ground, reaches high, and swats it down. Mm -hmm. I think just from this guy, like, good round of applause for timing. That's a very difficult play to make, and it's uh, difficult timing to master. So good on him. And uh, Mike, you got to hit higher. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's what I'm seeing, Mike. For the first three sets that you've gotten, your hip shape is definitely improved. So now it's facing the back middle instead of the back corner. As a right side, we'd like our hips to be open to the back middle of the court. A lot of people run at the corner. It's not necessarily ideal all the time, but there's a place for it. So you've started with open hips, but this ball is still falling on your left shoulder so there's i think there's still a setter miscommunication here because a lot that one just barely got to your right but really it's not so there's a low set and it's inside which means that it's falling on your left side which means it's going to be hard for you to get power homeboy delays nicely again but let's look at this one Ooh, one-handed stabby that one got to your right. That was nice. Yeah, really nice set. Yeah. That's a left shoulder set. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? Yep. Okay. So that's, I mean, you've got the space there. Setter's got to push it out. Let's see this. Yep, left shoulder set. So your hips, we didn't redesign them mm -hmm. so that could change your set location yeah we redesign them so that you have a better bailout if the sets if the set falls on your left shoulder right and um and so that you can increase your power when that ball is on your right shoulder so you're not chasing so you're going your body into the court but that should not have changed anything about where your setter needs to put the ball he still has to put this ball on your right shoulder and so we've got three sets so far that have hit your left okay so look this is where my cursor is right yep so it's above this this mucky muck this is where the set should fall yeah so we're missing by four to five feet okay uh, and if you keep getting your left shoulder set like this you're going to have limited height limited power limited options and that, in his play, in his event, that's that wasn't a great pass for him to push it all the way out there. So that's why I want to keep that pass more like where I just passed it right there. Then he's got a little bit; it's a little easier for him to control. But um, I like that you're taking uh, that on yourself. But this is open men's volleyball. Yeah. Like, if you <laughs> if you're able to get two hands on the ball, you got to put it where it's got to get. Um, and this isn't like a one set type thing because this is now five sets in a row. So he's aiming at a spot that isn't ideal. 
right? It's not like he's missing every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe when you see a mistake happen five or six times in a row, uh, it means that the aiming or where what they're going for is just not the right spot. Got it. Okay, so let's see where this ball falls. I've put my cursor. Can you see my cursor, Mike? Can you wiggle it again? Yeah, now that? I can. Yep. Okay, so that's where the set should get based on where you are right now. Okay. Four to five feet inside. See that? And that looks like it's forcing me to shoot cross and swing cross. Like I can't possibly get my elbow around to swing line, really. You can. You just have to have a mean opening, and you're going to be lower because you're going to be hitting that over your left eye. You know, so yes, can you make this slightly better with feet to ball? Yeah. Can you make can you make that hard line swing happening with like really opening your thoracic and hammering a wrist away? Uh, yeah, you can do it. It's not impossible. I don't want mm-hmm. to say like, oh, left arm set means I can't side out because if you put that in your mind, well, your life is going to suck. Yeah. Right. Uh, but this is number six so far that has landed four to five feet too far on your left shoulder. Let's see this again. It's tougher from this angle, but your feet are on the sideline, right? So your feet are like maybe an inch on the sideline, which means this ball has to be placed next to the antenna. Like it should be no more than a foot from the antenna. That's about eight feet inside. Here we go. One more. Okay, so your feet, again, are on the sideline. That means this ball has to be basically on the antenna for a pretty good design. We never really want to push it that far, but because of where you are right here, that's where it has to get. Wait. Four to five feet inside. Last ball, because we know what the problem is. (laughs) Okay, this is nice space. Good. Here's your right shoulder. If you guys are matching up right, this set should fall right here where this cursor is. Good. Nice set. This is where you get swatted. Okay. So how can I, as the, as the passer, ask for a better set? Uh, scream push. (laughs) Push me out. Uh, you know, there's, there's two different ways. So you can, you're doing a, a relationship set. Yeah. So what you could do is you could run a fixed point set. Now a fixed point set means you see these logos on the net. Yep. You tell him, hey, no matter what happens, unless I call X, you're putting the ball on this logo. Once you choose the logo that he's going to set you at, you just make sure that as a right-handed right side, you are inside that logo so that when he does set that place on the net, yeah. it's definitely on your right arm. And then it's your job to line yourself up. And he has a very, very clear target. And he knows whether the set's inside or outside because you know exactly where the ball has to get. Mm-hmm. Now, hopefully, you know, you guys have maturity as a partnership and he's able to say, like, shoot, that wasn't perfect. I'll make it more perfect instead of, ah, that's good enough. You should go get that, right? When we start playing the blame game, it just, everything crumbles, it sucks. Um, So if you give him that fixed point, then you could just fix your lineup. So you stay inside there. If you don't want to run the fixed point set, if you still want to do the relationship set, you have to tell him, you have to throw that over my right. You have to push it outside of my body because it cannot fall in between you. If you were a left side, these would all be pretty decent sets, but you're a right side, so it's falling on your left shoulder. Gotcha. I wonder if, too, if like if if I'm not getting the set I want on the right side, maybe I mix in a couple where I go behind, and I maybe make my hitting window even larger. I'm a righty, so it's possible that if I can let it drift out to me, instead of working hard to bump out and then taking an aggressive approach in, maybe I incorporate access i think i only did it once this whole video but uh you're right in the like i should you know maybe get really clear in warm-ups mm-hmm. about where i like my set what how high i like it but as a mid-match fix maybe i start running behind more that's a yeah that's a good short-term fix yeah right but um 
That's not going to help you out long term or when you get stuck on the right or when it's match point. That's finally a good set. There we go. Yeah. Um, this this has to be fixed, and it's you know if we we're on the court together, it would be fixed in one session where I would say nope, <laughs> nope, 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 too far inside. And we when we do it at the camps, people really realize how far how far off they're locating the ball. But yeah, he's uh, these sets are just not allowing you to get the ball on your power window. So you're really forced to go extremely high for high lines, weak, hard lines, yeah. um, or just over cross. And that, uh, that last blocker that you played was, I would say timing the blocks perfectly well for how you were getting set. Yeah. Hey, hey Mike, did you feel like you were able to reach as high as you could on any of these? Maybe like percentage wise, how many did you feel like you were able to? Yeah, no, there were probably, I don't know, 20 clips in here. And I feel like I really connected well on three or four of them. Okay. You know, a lot yeah. of the times that you see me shooting, it's because I'm not in a comfortable hitting yeah. uh, timing, approach, whatever. Uh, or maybe the pass was off. Like it's, you know, again, it's a, it's a two, two way thing. Totally. So three, but, three or four, 20. Yeah, totally. But I, I think also, Sometimes when I, I, from watching this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, from watching this, it looks like he's missing inside, but also low. Mm. Like I feel, I feel very rushed and tight watching this mm. um, to where if it's fast, yeah, you still are able to see uh, the defender move because they're not expecting it either. So you can still have your vision, but you aren't you really aren't able to open up and like yeah. be able to have the ability to swing. So my question to you would be what's what's your ideal set? Like do you do you know yeah. what you're looking for? Um, and especially whenever you're playing with someone and you start to realize they can't quite get it to your right shoulder. For me personally, I play right side too. Obviously, yeah. I'm a little shorter than you are, uh, so you should totally be reaching way higher than I do. But yeah. I think that whenever you're, whenever you start to realize that he's dropping these sets inside, maybe just ask for more height. Like if he is unable to do that in a in a game, um, and then that way you can still have the ability to step close because a lot of these feel like it's really low and falling inside, so it's really hard to adjust to be able to open up and still be reach, reaching max height. Uh, I yeah. feel like you, yeah, I haven't, I don't think I've seen you open up really mm -hmm. any. Um, yeah. and, and so that's a sign that you're feeling rushed. That's a sign that you're feeling low. Um, and you just feel the need to do whatever you can to get to that ball. Um, so, so maybe start experimenting a little bit more with a few more higher sets. Like, obviously, Phil Dahlhauser is one of the best to ever do it, but he liked his sets super high. I mean, I think Nick Logan too. does, too. Logan, Nick Logan wants it jacked up. Yeah, yeah like, as as high as he put, could possibly get it, <laughs> because then that gives him the ability to truly open up and go up and get it and go over people. Yeah. Right? To answer so, your question, I haven't defined it as probably precisely as I should. Like, gotcha. I've heard you guys talk about before, you know, if you're not – walking onto the court, being able to identify right. how many feet above the antenna, how many feet off the net, like with what spacing, you know, then, then it's like, that's your fault. Because if, if my partner Kevin here is asking me, was that a good set without a good set? And I just say yes, then why would he change it up? Right. So maybe I have to get better at identifying, was it me or was it the set? And then right. from then on out, it's easy, easy game. Yeah. And, and one good system is one to five. Like, uh, I think Mark and I have talked about this on here before, um, yeah. but there's a really good system that it's obvious if it's a miss or it's a good it's a good set. So yeah. one to five, one starting at the left antenna, three in the middle, five at the right antenna, obviously two and four in the right places too. But, but like with that system, it's very obvious, like what set you're wanting. If you're going into it and you're saying, hey, I want, Hey, just so you know, I run with this number system uh, yeah. and uh, majority of the game, I'm going to ask for a four or a five and it, yeah. I need it to be high, you know, just like going into it with that. 
Um, yep. And then maybe if I pass a little bit two in front of me, I'm going to go three, blow three or two. Uh, so that system is very clear of what you're looking for. Or like, like Mark said, finding uh, the verbiage on the net, that's also a good way to do it too. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd recommend experimenting with the height of your sets because I think you can be reaching a lot more high than you are right now. No, like I'm, I'm feel like I'm attacking it. Like I'm, you know, eight inches shorter than I actually am. Yeah. Yeah. You like, could totally have- like, dude, I'm scared of the day that you figure out your <laughs> set and you're able to reach as high as you can. <laughs> like, That's like, nice of you. Like, I want to work to get there. So yeah. yeah. Got a long yeah, off season, it's, boys. Got a long off season. <laughs> it's not that much work. I mean, it's really not. Yeah, you dude, got your, it. your approach is there. Yeah. You're on time. It's just it's it's low and inside, which is the ultimate nightmare for a right side. Right. It's like we we serve <clears throat> at our level. We serve to try to cause that set, and if we cause right. that set, yeah. we consider it a win because now our dig percentage is going to go way up mm-hmm. as soon as you're set low and or on your left shoulder as a right-handed right side, I'm like, I'm foaming at the mouth. I'm ready to go in for a kill as a defender. If I don't cause that set, then it's like, all right, might have to just weather this storm here, Mm. you know? Um, But that is everything that I dream of defensively is seeing that set fall on the left shoulder of an attacker, right? That's what we're trying to cause because that is the ultimate like handcuff position for for an attacker. Have you ever watched Jay Gibb? Uh, and just like for fun, not for like analysis. Yeah, I'd rec- I'd recommend you analyze a few of his games. I think they're similar similar movement. Yeah. yeah. Now that I'm thinking about that, Matt, that like you guys have kind of yeah both yeah. those long limbs. You like that big long approach. Um, yeah, yeah one that's thing, a good call, Matt. One thing that Jake does really well is he gets so much space on his right shoulder from his his point of preparation. Every single time, it's super disciplined. The same with Tribe Warren, but tries on the left. He does the same little gallop right before he's about to approach. Yeah. And it's like almost the perfect timing with the pass landing in, tra- in Cameron's hands. And same with Jake. Every time Jake passes it, he takes like two shovels to the inside and looks down and then he gets ready to approach. So maybe, you know, just ex- just analyze his game, see what you might want to keep, see, and look at the set he uses too. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that could be a helpful thing to, to look at for you too. So highly cool. recommend that for sure. All right. Divine the set. Thanks, boys. Totally. Holla. Uh, for everybody at home, the easiest way to make sure that you guys are doing this, like absolute easiest way, and we talked about it in one of the other meetings, is it, all you have to do is you can toss the ball to your setter and then move somewhere, left or right, and then make sure that your foot and your hips and your feet are planted before they set. Then look at the line that your toe that your right toe would create if you're you know if you had a line extending through your right toes to the net if the set falls inside of that line it's a bad set if the set falls on the right side of that line it's a good set so what i'm saying is toss to your setter from a serve receive standpoint stand still before they set without even talking Don't say outside, inside, whatever, right? Let them find you and know how to feel your body. So don't move. Leave your foot still. Let them set. Then look to see if it fell outside the line of your right foot or inside the line. If it falls inside the line, bad. If it falls outside the line, starting to get towards good. All right, and it's a very, very easy way to visualize it so that setters know, like after they set, they see the ball land, they look at the body, and they go, oh, inside i did it um and it's it's something that we do go through at camps it's a very slow drill but it's very eye-opening for a lot of setters and a lot of hitters for what they want to do so toss stand still don't call for a set let the setter set let the ball land see as a right-handed right side if it falls on the right side of your right toes uh the exact same thing for left sides right if your left side just toss that ball let them set stand so that you're facing as if you were about to approach but don't approach let the ball land see if it fell on the right side of your right foot line thing and that'll that'll be a very very easy drill for you guys to connect 
quickly on what needs to happen as a setter. And this is the easiest drill for everybody to do from beginner all the way to open to make sure that you guys are on point. I like that. It's good. Yeah. Okay, cool, Mike. Um, yeah, higher sets, push to the right arm. Boom. Uh, Travis, let's rock and roll, baby. Let's get it. From down under. We don't make enough Australian jokes. <laughs> uh, when Travis is off. Uh, well, I'm back in Canada for this season, but I'll be back to Australia in November. Awesome. What part of Can where Canada? From, where in Canada are you from? Yeah. Uh, Vancouver, <laughs> Vancouver Island, Victoria. Okay. Yeah, we might have to come back to Six Pack and run another three day. Definitely. I really liked it when I came there. Definitely. Wait, when did y'all do that? Uh, this is when we were Volley Camp Promosa. Oh, before man. your time, Matty. Man. <laughs> BM, before Matt. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh so travis what are you thinking um it was a pretty good week last week um we won our threes grass division um Sick. in the finals go, dude. Uh, and then sunday we had a social uh tournament with our local boys and it was all organized in like proper tournament format uh we won every game except for the finals uh but we played really well and yeah really happy with the performance cool yeah way to go Way to take home the gold, baby. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like it was that helped you win? Oh, lots of things. Um, just focus. I think recurring and uh, coming back to these meetings with you guys and like just all of like, yeah, polishing these different skills and better communication on the court. Um, uh, one of the big ones I remember you guys said last week was using the tools that we already have and not trying to change things up during a game. Um, and so we just like really leaned into what we were good at. Um, so this is all from the, the beach on Sunday. Um, and I admit, uh, I haven't had a chance to edit and put things together. So it's just a compilation of clips, uh, multiple little videos in that, in that Facebook post. Oh. oh, I'm only seeing one clip here. Um, yeah, I wonder... let me just go back to, go back to the whole group and then I'll see what we got. It's me talking to some FIVB refs. All right, here we go. Okay, so what's going on in this play here? Um, yeah, I guess just getting a little bit more prepared, getting back um, rather than just watching that ball over. I know that did come up a couple times for us. We've made the hit. Uh, we watched the ball over rather than getting prepared and, and getting ourselves into that next uh, position. But here I dart myself over. Um, whether or not I should have gone for that block, not sure, but... I saw a ball coming over, had my partner go for it, and then tried to continue that play out. Mm. Yeah, so that was the dig. This is the set. So the setter's in the set phase. Mm -hmm. uh, they dug your spike. And your defender here is at half court. So he's not back into position yet mm -hmm. in order to really defend the on two. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this just so that you get used to it right away. Uh, here's what the world's best blockers do. When you hit an easy free ball, when you serve any serve as a blocker, uh, when you attack with a, let's call it budget cut shot, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you know that the other team's going to dig, yep. the blocker should instantly run at the setter. Okay. Most blockers, right, until that open or pro level, they run at the person who's, well, you know, the beginners don't move anywhere, but uh, most people run at who they think is going to be the attacker. So the person who just mm. dug, but if you give somebody an easy free ball chance or a way to make an easy dig, the blocker has to cue on the setter immediately and defend them first, make sure that they're not attacking. Then you move to the hitter. Okay. So we talk about that a lot in serve receive where it's like, okay, make sure I guard the setter uh before to make sure that they're not attacking then i can start lining up on the hitter but this has to happen every play every time the ball goes over the net and uh this is what teams would want they would want to see an easy dig and nobody in front of the setter because uh a, a pro team on this ball would annihilate this you know quickly on an open net Definitely. so defenders got to get back a little bit quicker and you as a blocker, you always have to think, who's the first attacker? Mm. It's not the person that dug the ball. 
It's the person that might set or might attack. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the question of is there a threat is is great to ask there. Like is is there a threat that this guy is going to take this ball over? And what can I do to eliminate an, an, or just enough of the court to where he feels my presence? Because right, right there, if you're kind of scrambling to get a block on that, then it's, you know, ultimately it's just kind of like a last second block. So you got to decide earlier saying, hey, I, I, there's there might be a threat here. I need to make sure that I, I make him know that oh, I, I know that he's going to be attacking. And it makes him think a lot more. Um, what beach is this? As Willow's Beach um, in Victoria. It's pretty sick. Oh, okay. um, there's actually a lot of work that goes into it. Um, I, I'm not so much a part of it, but over the winter, uh, this beach is filled with driftwood. Uh, and the community here, they like come clear all the driftwood. They level out the sands. Um, we put up all these barriers around so it doesn't impact other beachgoers. And it's like a, it's a pretty narrow lane for what we get to yeah. play. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of dedication on this beach. That's pretty safe Good for that community. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that that water's pretty tight there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what do you like on this play? Um, I felt overall my serve receive was a lot more consistent. I was putting that ball in a pretty good location for my setter. Um, I've been feeling more explosive on that approach rather than I think last week we were looking at how far behind the camera I was starting. I was starting really, really, really far back on that approach. I think I've tightened that up a bit more um, and kind of found my lane a little bit more. I was getting a lot more side outs this day than I think ever before. Um, nice. I really listened to my partner too. He'd called that high line. So I knew there was a blocker coming and I was pretty happy that I got it over to not only the blocker, but the defender too, and still landed it in. Great job. Heck yeah. Uh, and, and I just want to caution everybody at, at home when we talk about calls from your partner, right? We have to always remember, always remember that the call is your backup plan when something went wrong and you couldn't see. Uh, at the World Tour, World Tour and AVP, there is no correlation, no statistical correlation between set call and did the attacker actually listen and the actual result of did they win if they listened or did they win if they didn't. So if we know that there's no correlation between the attackers, uh, between the setter's call and the result of the hit and the result of the play, won or lost, then we know that at the highest level, players really are not listening to their setters. If it, if anything, it might reconfirm or give you a bailout if something went wrong and you're blind and you can't see. But everybody out there who is waiting for a call or screaming at their partner, you got to give me a call. You are not going to get past a certain level, right? You're relying on somebody else for your offense. So the set call, while it should be mandatory for the setter, the majority of the time as the attacker you should be ignoring it because you should be looking and seeing your own spots so that's the level that you have to get to if you're not at that level yet or you're really uncomfortable looking then yeah you're forced to listen to the set call and you should follow that in that tournament in that match until you figure out how to look once you can look then you will ignore your setter for the rest of time, unless you're in a crazy transition, like awkward uh, situation. Okay, Mark, so what's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Travis, what do you got? I was just gonna say, uh, could you rewind this clip to the point in which I should have made that look for myself rather than yep. relying on that? Yes. Ba, 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 ba. So you passed, here should be your first look, okay? This is where you're surveying the court. And the only reason for the first look is to start just cueing your eyes to say, I am a looker, right? I see the court. Some people don't. Like if you kind of look at John Hyden 
Uh, everybody goes, oh, he looks at his feet. He looks at his feet to make sure that he's in the right spot on the sand. He doesn't even know that he does that. Uh, I talked to him about it. <laughs> and he's like, really? People comment on that? They say that I look at my feet? And I'm like, yeah, man, you should go online sometime. <laughs> uh, but it, the only look that he gets is at the very end when your hands go back. So your pendulum of your arms go back. That is your opportunity to look. So here's your first look, and this just tells your body, I'm looking at the other side. I'm getting an idea for where they are. Your second look should be right, oop, slightly before this, here. So at this point where your arms are at their maximum back and you're at the bottom of your squat before takeoff, that's when your eyes should go forward. So when your arms are back, your eyes are forward in your jump. And you would see him kind of see how he's starting to shift over that way. Mm -hmm. Yep. He makes that move. That would be your cue to hit high line. Okay. And that's all that you're looking for that little, Oh, okay. He moved to the left. I can shoot. Right. Um, Mark, there's a, you want to share about the, the drills that we have for those? those are, oh. we, we've got a few really good ones for a look. Yeah. Um, Travis there for sure in the attacking course. So go straight to the side out course that you have in your library mm -hmm. and look at uh, the chapter that says vision, vision and decision making. Look at all those drills. You can warm up with them. You can do pepper with them. Uh, there's a lot of them. And then also in the free drill book, if you guys are listening at home, if you go to better at beach.com, go to better beach.com and go to the free tools section in the header and you'll get 36 free drills. There's one for decision making there. It doesn't have videos, but just diagram. But since you have the the library, just go and, and use those vision drills as fast as you possibly can. Yeah. My favorite my favorite is the one where uh, you're just tossing it and you're with your partner and you start playing rock, paper, scissors while the ball is in the air. And so you toss it to yourself and then you take a look and if they hold a rock, you have to play paper or save paper to win it and i because then it's it's so it correlates so well to to the actual attack because you can't just look at the defense and say oh they're standing in cross it doesn't stop there you have to realize what beats cross and it's like a, a high line so it it warms up that mentality of not only do i need to see the defense but i need to know how to beat the defense so that that toss to yourself game and then playing rock paper scissors with your partner that you're you're tossing with is a really fun one to warm up with. It gets the mental brains flowing too. Uh, we've got one on YouTube. I'll let it play and I'll turn the the music on here. I get. And then we are uh, getting into Nicole's stuff. I got you a part. Some of your possible defense, never know vision eyes better with better vision and get more kills. Okay, so in this drill, uh, to ourselves with our partner, we pass to ourselves, we set to ourselves. After we set to ourselves, our partner should be showing their palms down or at their face. Your job as the hitter is to, after you're set, look to see where their hands are and continue this pepper so that you hit at their hands. Uh, one of the common mistakes that always happens is people forget to show a sign. And then, you know, the person who's going, they say like, dude, you got to show me a sign. Uh, and they stop the drill. Instead, just say nobody or say nothing out loud and then hit them right in the face and uh -huh. get them to start showing their sign. <laughs> um, and even if they hit to the wrong side, so if you're the person showing the sign and playing defense, then uh, if they if the player hits to the wrong spot, continue to play. All right, don't just stop that drill. But this is a really good warm up. It's called three touch vision pepper. If you guys want to look it up on YouTube for yourself, uh, just look up Better at Beach Three Touch Vision Pepper, and it'll show up on our YouTube. Do, do, do. Good, fun, easy drill. All nice. right. I like those. Yeah. Cool. Um, because we're running a little late, Travis, we're going to move on to Nicole here. Sounds good. Thanks, guys.
Thank you. Nicole! It's been a minute, girl. How are you? Welcome back. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, good to see you. Yeah, glad to be back. Had a a few things going on in the business, so I had to take care of that for a little bit. We're good now. Not a bad problem to have. With the the free running and parkour gym? Yes, we had a whole like sales and system implemented so i had to be around to see how it works and get people trained let and me, yeah let me get you on the other podcast and i want to hear all about it sure. yeah. cool. all right so let's look at your stuff and let us know what you want to talk about here okay i think the biggest one is i'm trying to get myself back into the habit of like feeling comfortable swinging when there's oh, yeah. a and swinging what? Um, swinging when there's a block up. So I've nice. noticed yeah. I've gotten in this really bad habit of every time there's a block up, I like exclusively shoot, um, mm-hmm. which has worked for a long time now. But now that I'm starting to play better people, they're scooping those up. So I got to be able to swing as well. <laughs> Mark, you want to say it or me? You got it. Nicole, first three points of the game. I want you to go in. When there's a block up, go in, swing as hard as you can. And before you even hit it, I want you to just scream over you. <laughs> I don't know if I have it in me. You got it, Nicole. Here, maybe we can practice. Practice. Sure, say over you really loud right quick. Me? Come on. Yeah. Come on, Nicole. Do it. I, I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm need some time to practice on my own in the mirror. <laughs> Yes, I look forward to the videos. Okay. And then I'll, I'll yeah. definitely hit different on the on the women's side than it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I make some enemies on that one. <laughs> um. Yeah, we definitely make some enemies saying that's 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 not one you say with friends. But yeah, uh, I'm, not, I'm not giving you any feedback until I see a video of you screaming over you. <laughs> you're you're banned for feedback right now. <laughs> um. And Nicole, there's, there's something to that. There's something about uh, deciding early in a match that you are, for the indoor players out there as well, that you are willing to take this person on head to head. You know, there, there's something that happens in terms of confidence where you say, I'm going to hit this ball high on the last fifth of the court so that it lands steep. And I'm going to hit right at the blocker, hmm. you know, where are they? I'm going to go right for their head and I'm going to stay high and I'm going to swing. If you find that like courage is somehow lacking. I remember this very specifically. My coach reamed me out with one sentence in college. Um, and he just said, challenge the blocker. Yeah. And I was just like, Oh yeah. I kept trying to do everything I could to not get blocked Mm -hmm. instead of doing everything I could to get a kill, to rip the ball hard and bring heat. Uh, So I had to start saying, okay, wherever the block is doesn't matter to me anymore because I'll stay high and I'll hit high enough where even if they get a block touch, I'll just cover it. You know, I I had that libero background, so I could always just cover any block that I wanted, even in the air. I had, you know, block covers while I was still floating in the air after getting blocked. So the, the, the thing about bringing confidence, if you think that you are exclusively a shooter, is don't try to avoid the blocker. Flip that script and mentally just be like, I am about to disrespect everything you have about your block. You don't have to say that out loud, you know, um, if, if that's requiring the over you call, that's fine. But on the inside of your head, you have to say, this person is not that good. I, my best swing is better than their best block. And mm-hmm. then you start repping that out a couple of times, you know, over time, if you keep hitting at somebody's head, eventually one of those things is going to land for a block. But the actual percentage of when you hit near a blocker that it turns into a stuff block point for them, it's crazy low. Like the positioning that has to happen there for them to get a roof block that is uncoverable, it's crazy low. So it's better that uh, from a confidence standpoint, you go right after a blocker and you just hit high and you're like, I'm going to rip her fingernails off right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, that's good from a courage standpoint if you're... Yeah, feeling and it's good to open a game like that and say like okay 
we've we've conquered that little monster right away. Right. Yeah, I think a, a good way to train that too is with boogie boards. Mm -hmm. um, like trying to find ways to chisel it off the top of the boogie board. I was playing a game last night. I, I was subbing with my 43-year-old best friends, uh, <laughs> his league team. And I was just playing an inner game of figuring out how many times I can just hit it off the top of the block. And my percentages were pretty high whenever I would do that. I scored probably about 90, 95% of the time, 90, 95. And I was like, wow, that's like a really cool stat to see. So maybe it takes just a few pickup games to be like, all right, all I'm going to do is just try to swing high at the block. Just see what happens. Now, if they start pulling, then it's like, all right, maybe I shouldn't play that game there. But, but yeah, try to find ways to challenge that, challenge yourself in that way. And I think boogie board drills are great, like using a boogie board as the block and like trying to see the boogie board and then hit it off the top of the boogie board. So like the upper, upper fourth of the boogie board, like try to try to chisel it as much as you can. Yep rip it i mean i wouldn't okay. even say chisel i'd say rip it as hard as you yeah can. break it in half yeah i just hit that top line um from a drilling standpoint here love this drill i think it's massively important just high lines high lines high lines just repping it out i would say uh if you want to report back to your training squad here eight to nine out of ten of these digs are just way too low yeah so mm -hmm. there's never a a separation of somebody getting up or stopping their dig motion, turning it into a get to my, we'll go with McKibbins here, get to my batter's box motion, and then start my approach motion. It's three separate mm -hmm. moves. And here it's just, they're all connected because everybody's digging so low that every hit is rushed. Like nobody here has felt comfortable and done a, four-step approach from where they want to take a four-step approach right even here she set herself up nice but because she dug so low her step didn't have time to set herself up um same thing there low dig these digs on the high line should be at least twice as high as they're getting right now okay, okay. and then once you do that then you can set up your offense but here's a here's a really good example of it she has to sprint nonstop from her dig location and then she can't slow down her sprint and then she has to stop instead of jumping and get an attack. And if she would have just doubled that height, she would have had a whole nother mm -hmm. like 0.5 seconds to be able to get to her hitting lane, her hitting lane. Gotcha. So next time you girls do these drills, everybody should, when you dig a high line, the stadium, your partner, you, should stand up and breathe. It should be high line. <sighs> then we can start our approach and getting into position, but it shouldn't be high line run, right? All these are high line sprint, high line sprint, high line sprint. Yep, and I got my co-host coming in, guys. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hi, you and Travis with your co-host is the best. Yeah, she's got a new teddy bear. By yeah, it's a new teddy bear. She loves it. All right, co-host. Um, so high lines, we're going to dig higher. Uh, make everybody dig those balls way high. You should be able to breathe or relax in between your dig and then getting to position. And then there should be a dig, get to position, slow to fast approach. If you don't see definite separations in between those actions, you're not digging high enough. This is great. You see that? See what you did there? This like you take a free ball and you pop it up nice and high to slow things down. What we need when you're horizontal and laying out for a dig. You want that same ability to go, ah, let's breathe. Oh, a little confusion there. <laughs> nice sit in the middle. Nice stab. Um, so I have, a, I have a question for you. What is your intent with staying here this long? What do you think is going to happen? You're sitting in the back middle, right? What's your intent in the back middle? Uh, 
Uh-oh, yeah, she put internet. Yes. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Nicole! Okay. Well, we could finish the recording, and I'll, and I'll finish my with my analysis because it is freezing up on Nicole's end just a little bit, maybe our end. But if it gets back up to speed, Nicole, you just tell me. Uh, she's she's sitting back middle here. So if you're listening, maybe podcast at home, or you're watching this video, Nicole sits back middle, and a lot of us are taught to enter the court this way. I serve, I go straight to middle. Then after the set, I eject to either my hard line defense or my hard cross defense as a defender. This sometimes works. And in my experience and film study, I, I, the best teams are getting rid of this. Okay. The problem with sitting middle so long, number one, uh, some people say I'm going to sit middle so that I can defend on two. Okay. But we should be playing on two defense the same way that we play on three defense, mm -hmm. which means you should have a line or a cross call and you should be covering your zone. And hopefully the blocker can get a hand and make somebody go a little bit higher. You know, if the other team is bumping over onto, hopefully you can be slightly centralized, but not dead middle. There's no reason to be dead middle. Well, okay. There are reasons, but it shouldn't be the standard. If you watch, World Tour Volleyball. Defenders are going to their position early. They're going to their final position, either in the diagonal or the hard line, where they're going to end in their base defense. They're a lot closer there than most people think. Okay, And then, after the set happens, if you're saying, well, I'm doing it to hide from the, from the attacker, in other words, so that the attacker can't see where I'm going, Okay, that might work, but there's, there's two caveats. If they choose to hit hard, then you're going to be in a heavy movement pattern, moving outside the court, trying to bring heat back into the court. That is so hard to do. For you to have momentum going away from the court and dig a hard-driven ball, and bring it back to the middle. It's very hard to do. Uh, it's way easier to play a little bit outside in and to be stable. Now, if you're worried about them seeing you, okay, let's see what happens if they do see you. Be stable. Be ready to dig every hard-driven ball, you know, as if you were lined up there for 10 minutes just waiting for it. And see if they actually... Over time, three, four, five points of the same person siding out against you, are they actually shooting away from you? Are they really, truly seeing you in that spot? If they are seeing you from your base defense and they're shooting around you, then you have a couple options. Number one, peel your blocker late. Then it doesn't matter what they see. Right, Because now they're either going to hit hard middle or cut shot. If they hit high line, you should still be available for that. Um, and your blocker can get some nice high touches. All right, uh, That's one. Peel your blocker so that your blocker can help defend the shot. Because if a person's shooting us to death in volleyball, <laughs> then uh, our blocker needs to get involved in floor defense. The other thing is you can always juke and show different things. If they're looking at you so well, right, and you're in that pocket, that defensive hard-driven pocket, then you can still do your head fakes, your jukes, your jab steps to make that person just as insecure as you thought you were doing from the middle, right? Except now you have the ability to be stable and in the position that you actually want to dig hard-driven balls from. So... Remember, there's this whole like disrupt, disrupt the defense by using movement and juking. But the answer is no longer, so coaches, I really want you to get away from this. It's no longer enter middle, stay middle for as long as you can, 
then go to your hard driven position because that move that move makes you easier to see and it makes hard driven balls more difficult for you to defend if you have to make a giant move from middle to get into the hard driven pocket right you're going to be off balance and because the move is so big and you have to make such a big movement you're actually easier to see for somebody who has a decent vision ability. So I want everybody who's listening, go back and, and, and test me. Try me out. Take a look at some championship FIVB uh, matches and AVP matches and semifinals and championships and start looking at how early defenders go and just stay in their defensive pocket where they're going to dig from. And then, the, you know, one, two out of five, that's when maybe they'll shimmy from the middle of the court or they'll run some different types of plays from the middle of the court but that's a different style of defense our base defense should not be enter middle sit middle as long as you can then go to your hard driven place let's get rid of that on the whole and the players that will embrace that will definitely be getting more hard driven digs i promise you and then once you play the lookers you have those two solutions the people who look and shoot you then peel your blocker late or you show them jukes from your good digging position. Not showing jukes from this position that you would never dig a ball in anyway, so you still have to move to get out of there. Uh, let's, let's embrace that a little bit. And again, if you want to test me, test my knowledge, test the, the video analysis, just check out AVP Championships and, uh, and FIVB Championships. They're all over YouTube. Uh, just make sure while you're on YouTube, you subscribe to us. <laughs> hey yo. Hey yo. Okay. Uh, yeah, and let's uh, just watch one more for Nicole. Whoa, that's a late block of. Yeah, this is late block move. Um, we know that this person's not attacking. She's no overhead threat, so a blocker should have been on that attacker way sooner. Nicole, I think you did a good job of getting to a point of hesitation. You got your mm -hmm. arm set, which since you're a lefty, is not ideal. That set you all in more. This girl did a great job just being super stable. This is what we're talking about. So on the back right here, the way this girl just set herself up, nice and easy. She can make that hard-driven dig. She's nice and balanced. And she makes this look easy. Imagine how tough these plays would have been if she were still moving from middle to that pocket and then dig adds a whole nother level of complication. Really outside approach. I like the aggressiveness. Good cut shot. Um, this cut shot could get steeper, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. That, that cut shot could get steeper. I don't yeah, think she can hit her cuts six inches above the net. She yeah. can just floor it. Uh, yeah, all these, all those sets, I think, or I guess two out of three of those sets, Nicole, they, they reached your right arm and they need to fall inside. So a little setter correction would be nice. This is a really, oh, it was a good looking set. Okay, good. Do we get a left arm set? Oh, no. Okay, so those sets are getting pushed. It's crazy, Matt, how much we see just misunderstandings of what a perfect set looks like. Yeah, and feels like. I mm. think, I think whenever an attacker approaches and maybe they miss uh i think a really good question to ask is was it on my midline or was it on the correct hitting shoulder mm -hmm. and a lot of people think the midline is where it's supposed to be where like getting it to your hitting shoulder like is way easier to work with with way more options so it may feel like it's on your midline and you're like oh it's supposed to be on my midline that's where i want it but then you lose all your options. So that feeling is what you think is a good set. But in actuality, whenever you feel it on your directly on your shoulder, that's where it's like, okay, I want to feel that over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, that was a big thing for me. Like I was like, man, I'm supposed to be getting it at my 12 o'clock like, yeah, yeah. as much as possible. And so I had that feeling ingrained into my head whereas as soon as it leaked into my shoulder i was like oh no i need it on my midline and because that was the thing i felt over and over again but 
it took me a while to realize that to have it on my right, clearly on my right, is way better. And I needed to feel it a few times to feel like, oh man. And I use it in my warm up too, of like pass, tossing every single ball on my right shoulder. Mm-hmm. And just to be able to feel that over and over and over again, it makes me be able to look out for that easier while I'm playing games and while I'm training. Yeah. Yeah. And these girls here on the other side right now, I would say that this is the best series of set quality mm. uh, that we've seen on film today, like during this meeting, like that yeah. ball falls uh, outside shoulder. So that one was a left arm set. Okay. We don't like that one, but this next one gets fixed. She's a righty ball goes over wow. her right shoulder. Perfect. I love that set. Wow. Here's the next one. This ball falls inside the left side's right shoulder. Great. Didn't meet where her body was, left it inside so she can accelerate into the court. Okay. Here's another one. I think we've got another great set here. Does it go over the right? Oh, no. That one fell on kind of straight. Okay. Not ideal. Is there one more? Let's fall inside. Yeah. Okay. Low, but inside the right shoulder. Let's see what this one does. Right-handed. Yes, good right. Oh, she's a lefty, so that was a bad set. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that detail, everybody who's listening or watching, the detail that you have uh, with your setting, just overall, just needs to upgrade in terms of what we need, what we want from a set. And if you're a righty, Look at where your toe and your hips are facing. And if that ball does not fall on the right side of the line of your right toes, it's not a good set. Let's just embrace that and say, okay. Uh, However, mentally, you as a hitter, of course, any set is good enough for you. You get your feet to everything and you get a kill no matter what. It's just as a setter (laughs) we also need to say that i have to be perfect that ball has to get to the left side of lefties and the right side of righties and then uh everybody's hitting percentage will automatically increase right mckenzie right yes good (laughs) feedback mac good feedback mac yeah all right um that's it from us guys if you're in the meeting if you're if you're a member here and you're in the meeting please leave your browser open just so that uh we can finish uploading it it pulls the recording from your screen and uh that's it it should tell you when it's finished uploading if you guys are listening at home <laughs> or watching me can <laughs> her hand uh then we hope you enjoyed this. And if you want to become a member yourself, then sign up at betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching, and we can analyze your film and help you increase your game. And we are also your personal trainers, uh, and we are hiring a nutrition a nutritionist <laughs> to run a new one. So please, uh, oh, well, she's not, she'll be a personal trainer. <laughs> uh, motivational speaker, McKenzie. Anyway, uh, Remember that we have the workout programs, we have the nutrition programs, we have the skill courses and the strategy courses. So all of that's available to you if you come to betterbeach.com forward slash coaching. But for our elite members who join this meeting, thank you so much. Thanks for your dedication. I think you guys should give yourselves a pat on the back for how much you are embracing uh, this program. Okay, the camera rather would rather Mackenzie than me. (laughs) And uh, that's it. That's it from us. Matt, you got anything? That's it. Yeah, good stuff. Sign up for a camp. Come hang. Sign up for a camp and be on the lookout. Scottsdale, uh, Ozark, Missouri. We're going to try to get to Seattle and Boston. Of course, we will be at Grand Sands again. And uh, I'm looking at Lincoln, Nebraska. If you are in Lincoln, Nebraska, or you think we should run it there, DM me, motivate me. And we would love to come out to Austin. We get a lot of Austin, Dallas, and San Antonio requests. So we really want to make that happen as well. Uh, and if you have a facility that has more than four courts, four courts or more, and you think we should run there, we are filling up our 2023-24 schedule. And we'd love to swing by your town. But as always, we want you to visit us. It's St. Pete Beach, Florida, for our seven-day monster vacations. Those are super fun. That's cool. All right. From me, Mac, and Matt, we'll see you on the sand. Ciao. <laughs> Bye-bye.